This is a build, test, and performance review of an electric bike conversion. Uh, the bike we're going to be using is an inexpensive mountain bike, and the kit is a new Amped Bikes rear direct drive with a 36 volt sealed lead acid battery. So here's a complete bike before the conversion. It's got a solid rear steel frame, uh, front shocks, and a seven gear rear wheel. Uh, first, let's look at the kit. You'll get two separate boxes, one for the battery pack and one for the electronic components. Uh, in total, we have a rear wheel with brushless hub motor, a battery pack with three SLA batteries, uh, two brake levers, a speed controller, a rear bike pack, and a throttle. Uh, there's also some extra handle grips and some washers. My particular kit did not come with a bike rack, so I purchased another one that's going to look a little bit different. Now for our tools, we'll need a couple of crescent wrenches, a set of Allen wrenches, zip ties of assorted sizes, a tire pressure gauge, clippers, flathead and Phillips screwdriver, some tire levers, some extra locking washers, and some Loctite. Now that we have everything together, we can start prepping the bike. Uh, first thing we're going to do is open up the brakes so we can pull off the old brake levers. Uh, we need the new ones with the electric cutoff switches so the motor will stop running when we pull on the brakes. Uh, all we need to do is loosen the screw on the caliper and it'll pop open and pull the cable loose. Up at the handlebar, we need to remove both handle grips, shifters, and brake levers. An easy way to get the grips off is to pry it up with a screwdriver and spray some lubricant inside. Uh, wiggle it a little bit and with some work it should slide right off. Then we're going to use our Allen wrench to loosen the single screws on the shifter, slide it off, the brake lever, slide it off, and then repeat for the other side. Now the brake levers, depress the lever and remove the cable. Uh, keep the cable and discard your old brake levers. Clean off your handlebar as well to remove any lubricant and then install the new gear. First attach the new brake levers to the cables, uh, slide them on, and then tighten them until they hold, but you can still move them around. After everything is back together, you're going to want to adjust them so they're in a comfortable position when you lock them down. On the right side, install the new throttle. It also attaches with a single Allen screw. Install your old gear shifters and grips. Sit on the bike, adjust everything the way you want, and then tighten it all down. Be sure to set the cables aside or tie them up somewhere so you don't pinch them while you're working on the rest of the bike. With the handlebars done, we can start work on replacing the rear wheel. Uh, for this part, we're going to turn the bike upside down. The only difference between the front and rear drive kit is that we'll need to deal with the chain and the gearing. Uh, first, deflate the tire completely. Loosen the two nuts on the rear wheel enough so that the old wheel plays freely in the dropouts. Uh, you can manipulate the chain by hand and pull it off the gears, then slide out the old wheel. Uh, with the wheel off, uh, first remove the reflector. Uh, we're going to install that on the new wheel. Then pry off the old tire and remove that. You should probably use some real tire levers uh, so you can avoid popping the inner tube, uh, but it doesn't matter here because we're going to install a new self-sealing tube anyway. So now install the new inner tube and the tire on the motor wheel. Uh, be sure to cut a hole through the rim tape for the valve uh, so you can stick that through. Uh, with the new tire in place, add a little air, bounce the tire a little bit to make sure it's seated correctly. And now you can install the new wheel onto the frame. Uh, insert it back into the rear dropouts through the chain and then carefully reseat the chain onto the new gears. Uh, adjust the wheel so it's as far back down into the dropouts as it can be. Uh, that it's straight with the frame and then tighten it down. Roll the bike right side up again. Now it's time to run the cables from the front to the back of the bike. I loosely zip tie them in the front and along the frame so they hold in place. But you can adjust them if you need to. Be sure that at the front you leave enough slack so you can turn the wheel to full range without pulling on the cables.
Next, we're going to install the bike rack. Uh, the bike rack that comes with the kit needs to be assembled, but I bought a different rack that came as one piece. Uh, the bike rack usually mounts at the seat post clamp and a pair of holes near the rear dropouts. Uh, be sure to add some locking washers and some Loctite to the rack bolts uh, so they don't come loose with the vibration of the bike. Now we can install the speed controller. It doesn't matter where you put it, as it just attaches with some zip ties and needs to be anywhere that's well ventilated, uh, so it doesn't overheat. I installed mine on the seat post bar for the bike rack. Now route your cables and loosely zip tie them, and now you can make all your connections with the exception of the battery pack which we'll install last. Now once it's all connected, uh, tighten your zip ties and clip off the excess. Here's a closer look at the wiring and the connections. Uh, with this kit, each wire has a different pair connector, so there's almost no chance of plugging in the wrong device into the speed controller. You have a connector for each brake lever, which goes into a single wire for the speed controller with two connectors split off of it. Then you have the motor, a single connector. And now you have the throttle, which has one connector to the speed controller and one connector that shoots off to the battery neck. Once you have everything in place, mount the battery and use the Velcro straps on the bag to secure it to the rear rack. Now you can connect the battery to the speed controller with the red and black connector. And it's normal to hear a little pop when you plug it in. Now we should have everything from the kit installed on the bike. Uh, double check all your connections, tighten down all your wires, and it's time for a test. Lift the back wheel, switch the power on, and press the throttle. If everything went okay, the three indicator light should turn on and the tire should spin. If not, double check all your connections and that the wires are firmly inserted into the connectors. With everything complete, you probably have a big bundle of wires on your rear rack. You can either leave them there and zip tie them so they don't move, or you can buy a seat post bag or some other container to keep them in. I have a small $6 seat bag installed here. With the new tire and the rear installed, I also had some adjustments to make. Uh, first on the brakes, the right brake pad lined up to well with the tire, uh, but somehow the left brake pad was crooked so I had to bend the screw post to make it line up to the tire properly. Also on the rear gearing, we started with a 7 gear wheel and we replaced it with a 6 gear wheel. So we're going to need to adjust the derailleur on the back so the chain won't slide off the final gear. You might even want to take it to a bike shop and have them adjust it so it will shift nice and smoothly. What you'll also notice is you have about 55 pounds of extra weight on the back of the bike now. It's likely that the stock kickstand that came with the bike is not going to support the weight. So next we're going to install the rear kickstand. It mounts to the rear of the frame here and swings down at the rear wheel to better support the bike. So here's our finished product. A complete electric bike conversion with an Amp Bikes rear direct drive kit and SLA battery pack. Uh, most of what we needed came straight out of the box. Uh, we also had to buy some of our own washers, Loctite, cable tie straps, a rear kickstand, and a seat bag. I also bought a large nylon strap for the battery pack after some road tests. Now for the test and review. I did several tests with the bike over a total of 30 miles. Uh, on road, the bike's fairly stable and smooth. It has plenty of torque to start from a standing stop without pedaling. Uh, once up to speed, I found shifting the bike was almost unnecessary. I mainly used a low gear for slow speeds and a high gear for high speeds. Noise from the motor is minimal and can't be heard above normal wind. At around 16 miles an hour, there's a slight whine from the motor that lasts about a second and then goes away. Off-road, there were significant issues with the battery pack in the rear. I broke one bolt and even the valve and had to replace the inner tube. Uh, the battery pack itself doesn't secure the batteries inside the rack, so it bounces badly against the rack even on simple dirt trails. My solution was a large strap around the entire bag to secure the batteries down. Uh, that helped a bit, but I wouldn't try more than 10 miles an hour off-road. On my initial run, I had a fully charged battery pack. According to the speedometer, my maximum speed without pedaling was a decent 23.7 miles an hour. With a strong headwind, I couldn't get more than 20 miles an hour. I found that even in the highest gear, I couldn't pedal fast enough to keep up with the motor, so on this particular bike, it looks like that's my top speed. On a higher end road bike, you might be able to get a little more out of it. The second test was done with another fully charged battery to determine the total range. I discovered early on that there's a significant degrade in performance as the battery runs out. 
Once my throttle indicated a half charge, my top speed was down to about 19 miles an hour. Still not bad, but it steadily declined as I continued my run. Using almost no pedaling through a residential area, I was able to go about 17 miles before I saw a significant performance loss. Now my total trip was 21.4 miles. Now supposedly the SLA battery shouldn't be drained more than 80%, so I would say 20 miles is about the top range.